Kyle Klingman with Track Wrestling. We have a story that absolutely defies logic. John Peterson placed fifth at the NAIA Championships in 1971 and then made a world team in 1971, shortly after, Olympic silver medalist in 1972, and then won a gold medal in 1976, dominated the field. John, really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you for having me, Kyle. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Well, I appreciate that. And my goal with this is to try to understand this once and for all, how in the world you made this happen. Because contextually in the United States since 1948, if you've won the World or Olympics, if you went to a D1 program, we got to throw Henry Cejudo out. He won it in 2008. If you wrestled in D1s, you placed third or better at the NCAA championships if you won a World or Olympic gold medal. You got fifth in the NAIAs make a world team a few months later, which is incredibly hard to do. And then you get to the Olympics the next year in 1972, get a silver medal. How did you do that? You got to help us understand how you made that happen. It seems to defy what is possible in the realm of wrestling. Well, um, I'm not sure that I can explain it completely. I think you're right. It defies logic, but there, I think this is true of, of everyone who has success in, in the sport of wrestling. There are a lot of things that have to fall, fall in place, come together at the right time, be, be with the right people for, for you to succeed. And uh, that's the way it was. Uh, there, along the line, there are so many things that, uh, little things that um, either God put in my place, or I made a certain choice that if I had gone the other way, yeah, it would have been down a total different road. Um, you know, um, our founding fathers said that it was divine providence that got them through the Revolutionary War. And I think it was Benjamin Franklin who, when they were trying to figure out uh, what the government was going to be like, said uh, they were at an impasse. And he said, hey, guys. We didn't get here by chance. Maybe we should stop and pray and see if we can figure out how to design our constitution. <laughs> so I'm a great believer in God's divine providence and his guiding our lives. And so that's the best I, answer I can give you. Well, can you take me through the action steps that happen from placing fifth at the NEIs, presumably in March, to making a world team and making that leap later that year? Like what tangibly did you do to be able to make that happen? Well, uh, there was one, one big thing that happened. Um, I took second place in the Midlands that year. I defeated a guy from uh, Iowa State, uh, Keith Abens. And that's the first time that I met and talked with Dan because he was uh, one of Ben's teammates and, and Dan was, um, he was in graduate school then, but he was at the Midlands and wrestling in it, of course. And uh, he told me after our competition there, um, when you uh, win the national tournament, it would give me a call. So I can remember being out at Appalachian State. That's where the NAIA national tournament was my senior year. Crying like a baby out in the football field after I had taken fifth and thinking, I've got to call Gable up and tell him that I took fifth. I don't remember our conversation at all, but somehow uh, with that and Ben's encouragement, I decided I liked freestyle, so I wrestled in the uh, freestyle national tournament down in Oklahoma State a few um, weeks after the NAIA. And I wrestled at 163 pounds, and that was a ridiculous uh, weight for me to be at. I had weighed 195 in the summertime, and uh, still in pretty good shape when I weighed 195. And I think I think it may have been there that Gable said, "John, you should just wrestle 180 and a half." Ben agreed. Stop cutting that weight. And then Ben. Uh, Ben uh, took third in the, NA, in the uh, AAUs shortly after that. And so because he was national champion, he was invited to the Pan Am training camp. He called up Coach Doug Blueball, 
said, hey, can my brother John come to the camp? And so I am so thankful to this day that Doug said, yeah, that's okay. He, he, he told Ben, if he'll work as hard as you do at camp, he can come to camp. So I had to pay my way to that camp. Ben writes about it in his book that we were in Minneapolis and we get there to the airport and they're saying, I have to, I have to spend a, an extra amount of money uh, to get on that plane. And I didn't have a lot of money. And I was ready to throw the towel in and say, no, I can't do that. <laughs> and plus there were some times right before that when I would talk to Ben, I'd say, what business do I have going to that training camp you're going to? And we were working out running, trying to get ready for it. And he, he got a little upset with me. He said, John, stop comparing yourself to other people. Because I said, you know, there's going to be all kinds of national champions there. Here I am in fifth place. And he said, stop comparing yourself to others. They may be headed for failure. So Ben and this in other encouragement. So going to that training camp down in, in Tampa Bay and, and Miami, uh, I just made a huge, huge um, jump in my ability to uh, train at a, at a much tougher level, wrestling with guys who were much tougher than the guys that I had been competing with, although NAI was pretty tough back then, you have to admit. So your brother, Ben, was a two-time Division I NCAA champion for Iowa State. And then you guys have to wrestle off for the spot at 180 and a half, and you guys go behind closed doors, and you beat him. How do you do that? <laughs> uh, well, part of it's, it's uh, pride. You know, I'm an older brother. I'm a year and a half older than he is. Uh, I was quicker than Ben was, but he was – stronger, had the leverage. Uh, but now I'm training at Iowa State when that happened. The reason that that match took place was uh, we both wrestled in the uh, Federation tournament in the spring of 72, and we took fourth. We both took fourth. Ben got beat soundly. I think he says nine, nine nothing, nine one by Bill Harlow. I lost to Steve Combs 15 to nothing. We came back to Iowa State and Ben said, I, I got to cut down to 80 and a half. I said, I'm not going to 63. Let's wrestle off. Or maybe we'd, you know, we'll just both try out at 80 and a half and, and that'll give a better chance of one of us making a team. He didn't like that idea. So Doug Moses was our coach, <laughs> or he was our referee. We came to the wrestling room at Iowa State a little early and he, I asked him a while back, what was the score? He said, I don't remember, but I know you won. Good ben never talked about it after that. It would have been a disaster for him to cut down to 80 and a half because he wasn't quick enough for those guys. But then he, he, was goes, great. he goes on and wins a gold medal at 198. So you get a silver in 72. He gets a gold in 72 as well. So here you are. You're both placing fourth at – nationals and then you guys both medal at the olympics like what, how do you make such a rapid progression to get to that point well just a bunch of little things you know i wrestled i've told you this story before i think i wrestled teddy chevelli in the tbilisi in january and he pins me in the second period and gable came up to me after the match and said john you know who that was and i said no who was that and he said, well, that was Teddy Chevelli. You were at the World Championships. You watched him uh, win that tournament. I said, well, why didn't you tell me that before the match? And he, <laughs> he said, well, I knew you weren't ready. But he proceeded to help me get ready. And I wrestled Teddy Chevelli a month later in Anoka at the high school there in Anoka. We had one of our dual meets, and, and I lost uh, five to three. And he was an unbelievably explosive guy, but two on one that Gable worked on me almost every day, saying, you, you, you got to get close to this guy if you're going to take him down. I took him down three times with a double leg. So I was making progress. I, I just had a bad match against Steve Combs. <laughs> what, what did progress feel like? Well, I think I was surprised some of the times and some of the times that it, 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 it seemed more natural because I was training with Dan an awful lot and 
and Carl Adams. Uh, um, oh, who was the guy? Rick, uh, Rich Benick was uh, one of their top wrestlers at Iowa State. Um, uh, Carl Adams. I mean, uh, unbelievable working out with him a lot. He was quick as a cat, and to get to his legs was was really tough. And so, I. I was building confidence by the, by the moment, by the day, by the month. You said that Dan Gable would humiliate you without saying a word to force you back in and keep training. How does he do that? Yeah, that was one of the, the, the first impressions that I have from, from training with Dan because the first month or so, we would do a lot of morning workouts, just, to, just the two of us. Um, well, like I said, he would do it sometimes without saying anything. It is just his body language would let you know. When when we would take the break, I don't know how we decided it, but still to this day, it, it irritates me a little bit that I that I would give up too many times when when he would say, "Okay, this is the last takedown," but if I take him down, we'd have another one. <laughs> You didn't keep pushing it. Not like I should have. <laughs> so were you guys so ingrained in the sport that I've heard that instead of going and seeing the president before going to Munich, you guys went for a run. I mean, was that just part of the code you guys created along the way? Well, that was Dan. Ben and I were disappointed when he said, hey, guys, we're not going to the White House. Win a gold medal, you get invited to the White House. We actually took the beds in the hotel and put them up against the walls. And you, you wouldn't want to do that today, but and and made made the bathroom like a sauna for us, the steam room. And then Ben and I got our running stuff on, and we were naive enough to think that if we ran down to the White House, they would let us in. <laughs> we went to one of the west, I think it was the west gate of the White House, and. And uh, talked to the security guy there and said, you know, we're on the uh, U.S. Olympic team. Uh, could, we, could we get in? <laughs> I think he thought we were crazy, but. <laughs> you tried, though. We tried. <laughs> you tried for that. So you get silver medal. Ben gets gold. Did it surprise you that you did that well at 72 Munich Olympic Games? Yeah, I think I think both Ben and I, to be honest, were surprised that we were able to do that. And and yet, on the other hand, Gable had us convinced that we could do it. And uh, Coach Bill Farrell, uh, he was a great, uh, great coach uh, in the way he handled that whole team. He would bring our team in there in Minneapolis where we were training. I, I think it was probably every week, just the, just the 10 of us. And he would tell us how we were the best freestyle team the United States had ever put together and that we were going to surprise the world. And so uh, he, uh, Coach Farrell told me sometime later, this, this is a good thing for coaches to hear. <laughs> he said, you know, I didn't really think you and Ben were gonna, were gonna get medals. But once you, once you did, I could look back and I could see I, I didn't think you would. I knew Gable would, but you guys hung around Gable so much that it was just rubbing off. And so he had all those doubts, but there is never once in that whole training camp and in our time in Munich where he ever let me think that he didn't have full confidence that I was going to surprise an awful lot of people. He He built that confidence into me. Were you excited with the result then when you got a silver medal? I mean, what, what do you feel when you, you get a medal and you're not expected to? Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was overjoyed. Uh, I, you know, I worked with AIA uh, after that, and well, after teaching school for a year, and then I was uh, wrestling with AIA and going to college and universities. And, and after 76, somebody wrote an article about me and in the article, they said John Peterson was disappointed with the silver medal, and he worked four hard years to make up for it and get a gold. And uh, he wrote this article before he talked to me. He did an interview with me. <laughs> and I told him, that's not the way it was. 
I was happy with the silver medal and I was just wrestling one year at a time trying to be the best wrestler that I could be because I had learned from the mistake of wanting to be a state champion so bad and wanting to be a national champion so bad, putting all that emphasis on the title rather than making my number one goal, John, you be the best wrestler that, that you can possibly be. God's given you the talent to be able to compete. Do it at the highest level. And and, and Gable was a part of, of that, you know, idea of, of seeking perfection. <laughs> He'd say stuff like, you know, I want to be in every position in wrestling at least a thousand times. Well, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> so you get a, a silver in 72. Gable essentially retires in 1972. He had a couple comeback matches and a few things that he uh, came back for, but essentially he's gone. So four years later, you are trying to make the Montreal team, but something actually good happens to you and you get injured and Ben does not, and he trains hard and he goes into it. He's not as fresh, but you get injured. I think you actually walked out to the match for the Olympic trials with crutches. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The last, I think the last two matches in the trials, uh, I had, uh, had an, um, had an infection in my left knee and the and the doctors and trainers were concerned that that infection get pushed into the uh, in, inner part of the knee uh, and so they had a huge pad on it and they didn't want me to put a lot of pressure on it walking around so it didn't affect my wrestling that much um, it could have been a real mental block but I was wrestling at a, at a high level. And I had, you know, like you said, I, I had a whole month of March, no training at all because of the mono and the doc checking my blood. Then all of April, he let me work out once a day. And uh, yeah, then after that infection, after I did win that national tournament, I had two weeks off to get the knee healthy again. So yeah, I was, I was more or less like a caged guy who just wanted to compete. So it was scaling it back, whereas Ben was probably working through it, overtrained. You were getting peaked, and you didn't even know it. Is that accurate to what happened? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's accurate. There's more to it. I, I had spent uh, three years now with Athletes in Action, wrestling in dual meets against top schools in the country, getting the kind of competition that I maybe didn't have, like many uh, guys would have wrestling D1 all the time and having some great workout partners. Actually, Athletes in Action was a great fit for me. Um, Greg Hicks was, uh, I made the world team, well, I, I won the national tournament in 75, but then I tore, the, tore my shoulder in, and at the training camp, I guess it was before the, the actual tryout tournament to make the team, I pulled out. I just said, I, I can't compete. So that kept me back for uh, three, four months before I got that thing figured out. And then you blitzed the world in 1976. I think you beat your Soviet opponent 20 to four and, and didn't even have a close match. Did you just have it that day or those days? I, you'd probably have to say it that way because I'd wrestled that Soviet guy six times before and we always had real close matches. He beat me three times, I beat him three. I were all two to three, four, five, whatever. And uh, things fell together. <laughs> and then what happened to Ben? Like he got a silver medal and there's actually a, a story where he won, I think a 14 to 13 match right at the end. And someone from your hometown had a, had a heart attack from it because it was so exciting and he ended up dying. That's right. That was a Bulgarian. He wrestled the first match, first round. He was, he was, Ben was tired. I was upset with him in this, between the second and third period, I went in the corner and I said, Ben, you got to get out there. You're better than this. You got to keep going. You got to fight. Doesn't matter how tired you are. Stop thinking about how tired you are and you just go. What made you want to compete so long? I mean, you're not getting paid in this era. It's the, the, the amateur rules where it's not 
a profitable endeavor. Why stick with it as long as you did? I think you went through 1980. Why stay? Well, that's that, that's where some of us, uh, you know, with Athletes in Action had an advantage that other uh, wrestlers didn't have. Uh, we could raise money to be missionaries in the sports world and continue to compete. So I was able to make a living, uh, even get married. Uh, I, I thought when I joined Athletes in Action, uh, I, I'd do this for a little while, but then I wouldn't be married. Well, I get married, and then before you know it, we have our son, uh, John Mark. Uh, in 78, we took him to the World Championships. I wrestled in the World Championships with my five-year-old boy in the stands. <laughs> I got a picture of him when I won the World Cup in 1980. I'm holding John Mark. I I, I just I enjoyed the competition. and. Uh, and I saw how God was allowing me to use it as a, a way of helping young guys, some of them to not make the same mistakes that I made, putting the wrong kind of emphasis on finding my security in wrestling. And I was able to share that story with a lot of, a lot of young guys and still doing it today. We put the wrong kind of pressure on ourselves when we, you know, I know a lot of gifted athletes who find too much security in their sense of wrestling, and then they get to college, and, and uh, there's a lot of other guys that are just as good as they are, and they have a struggle with that, and then they put the wrong pressure on themselves. How did you adapt your training over the course of that time? So you're probably in a, a gable mode where you're training unbelievably hard for the 1972 Olympics. Did you have to make adjustments from 72 all the way till you retired in what, 1980? Definitely. Um, when I made the world team again in 1978, uh, I, uh, I had problems with a uh, sprained ankle. I had to, uh, uh, just my training. Um, I probably didn't sit down and have the right kind of talk with Coach Gable. Um, I can remember uh, thinking, you know, Dan, you maybe you don't understand how it's different now. <laughs> we can't train the same way we did back in '72. Chris Campbell, and I think that's the mistake that. Yeah, so Chris Campbell in 1980, made. I would say trained more like what you were talking about right there. You had to wrestle him for the 80 Olympic trials. Could you tell how good he was going into that 80 Olympic trials? Oh, I definitely could. I knew he was the next guy. You know, we wrestled off for the 80 Olympic team. So we went two, two out of three. And now he's one of the first guys that beat me when I was ahead of him. I had a, a good lead on him and I lost the last match. Uh, I think I had won the first one, he won the second, or maybe it was the other way around. But his high crotch was so slick. Uh, his wife was yelling at the corner. <laughs> He's tired, the old man is tired. And I wanted to say to her, it's not that I'm tired, it's your husband is just too quick and too slick for me. <laughs> But, you know, I, had, I was living over in Europe in, in 81, uh, training uh, Steve Barrett and Don Schuler, and I came back and, and worked with the uh, world team, uh, wrestled with, with uh, Chris quite a bit. We were, I'd say we were fairly good friends. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he was the real thing. Great athlete, hardworking, and and he was, he was a, he was a guy that would that would work on technique, um, and, and and get get it so that well he was doing like Gable would say, be in every position a thousand times, and he would get that down. <laughs> he would drill it over and over and over until it was perfect. <laughs> 